watch old Tom McKeever's cabin, I gotta haul myself across a canyon in a cable bucket 90 feet above the Thompson River. One reason my job never gets monotonous. I'm a rural social worker in British Columbia. My name's George Dillon. It's part of my job to call on all the old age pensioners in my district every so often to see how they're getting along. Tom McKeever is really too old to be living up here in the mountains all by himself, but this cabin is home to him, and here he stays. Wiry old chap. Nothing wrong with him, except he's getting older and needs a new set of store teeth. I've been trying to persuade Tom to move into town, but he says he likes it here. Never gets lonesome as long as he can see the trains go by. I think I'll get Tom to make a trip out one of these days to see a dentist. Then when he comes to town, I'll try to get him into the provincial men's home. That's about a hundred miles up the railway at Kamloops. I work out of the district office there. We handle all the social services in a mighty big area, sagebrush and mountain country mostly. Sometimes it takes me ten days to cover my own territory and we have two other visiting workers for the rest of the district. Then there's an office staff and our supervisor, Mrs. Anderson. Some people think of a social worker as a snoopy old sourpuss, like the one in York Wilson's painting. Well, I suppose there are a few of her kind still around, but not around here. It's a nice bit of satire, but I'm afraid that lady wouldn't last long in rural welfare. We're perfectly normal people, and we're very proud of our profession. That's what I've just been telling the new girl. She's a college student taking in-service training with us as part of her course. We have some pretty advanced social legislation on the books in British Columbia, but it can't just stay on the books. It has to be brought to the people who need it. And that's our job. And it calls for skill and training, which is true of social service anywhere, of course, but particularly true here because we have very special problems. It's a huge province, but so rugged and mountainous that most of our people are concentrated into one small corner of it. Nearly three quarters of British Columbia's one million people live within 50 miles of Vancouver City Hall. The big towns and cities have their own welfare departments and the province provides half the trained staff. This leaves rural welfare, that's us, the job of handling social services for the people in the lonely places. A few hundred thousand in a countryside bigger than France. So we've divided it into five great regions, each with half a dozen district offices like this one. In the city, a social worker can specialize. Out here, we can't. Our Miss Warren, for example, has 248 cases on her list, so she has to handle all kinds of problems. She isn't here today. She's in a little town about 50 miles out, following up some of those cases. <laughs> I can't think of them as cases. They're human beings. This time, two human beings, Peggy and her baby. The public health nurse put me in touch with Peggy a few months ago when Peggy took refuge in this town because her sister lives here. The poor kid hasn't a nickel, but we've seen that she had proper hospital care, and now I've got to help her to do some planning for the future. Peggy isn't married, but she has certain rights in this world, and so has the baby, human rights. For one thing, they have a legal right to some support from the child's father. Peggy doesn't even want to talk about him. It wasn't a love affair. Well, she had a few foolish drinks one night. And now here she is. And where is he? I have a letter here based on a report from Jim Cassidy, one of our social workers over in Region 2. Our network covers the province pretty thoroughly. We heard that this man was working in a logging camp over there, so we asked Cassidy to look him up. Jim had to borrow a jeep to make the trip over the mountain roads.
but the foreman says Peggy's boyfriend doesn't work there anymore. Quite a boy, some friend. He skipped out, no forwarding address. So that's that. Peggy says she doesn't care. She never wants to see him again, wouldn't marry him if he asked her. But she wants to keep the baby. And without job, money, or husband, that isn't going to be easy. She may give it up for adoption, but we'll talk about that later. I'll see what I can do, and maybe Cassidy will find the father. I'm glad I haven't got Cassidy's territory. That's wild country up back of Squamish. He says he likes it, but he can have it. I wouldn't like this country quite so much if I had to travel it on foot. Railway boys know I'd never get my work done if I had to wait for the local. On this job, you simply use any transportation you can find to get where you want to go. I've just covered a social allowance case near Alto Lake, and now it's a 25-mile downgrade run to be in time for a juvenile court case at Squamish. Joe Zangara, age 15, Freddie Wilson, age 12, charge, theft. Runaways. They were hungry, so they robbed a grocery store. It will help the magistrate if he knows something about their background, so that's where I come in. I have information about these boys. A letter from a social worker in Vancouver tells us what happened when she called at Joe's home to tell Mr. Zangara that his son was in trouble again. Joe hasn't any mother and his background isn't very good. Joe's father doesn't care what happens to the boy, but we care, and the facts will help the magistrate. As for Freddie Wilson, the younger lad, it's a different background. Mrs. Jenner, the social worker in Freddie's hometown over in the Okanagan Valley, sent me some information about him. Good upbringing, good school record. He's never been in trouble before. It's been a terrible blow to his parents. His mother is here today. It's a long journey from the Okanagan and I don't think she could well afford it. A few days ago, Mrs. Jenner called at the Wilson home, and she tells us the family circumstances haven't been good lately, because Mr. Wilson is in poor health. But they can't understand why Freddie ran away and got into this jam. We can't advise the magistrate what to do, of course, but we have helped with all this information. Joe, the answer seems to be an indefinite term at the boys' industrial school. Not to punish him, but to help him before it's too late. In the case of Freddie, family background makes a difference. The decision? Freddie is to be sent back home on probation. But that doesn't mean we're finished. These boys are at a critical age. Other social workers will follow up from here, at the industrial school and at Freddy's home. We work in terms of people. At the provincial parliament buildings in Victoria, our departmental heads work in terms of policy. It's their job to work out the program, which we translate into action all over the province. We spend more money on health and welfare than on any other public service. Most of it comes from a 3% sales tax. Municipalities using our service pay us according to population. We simply try to figure out a common sense way of handling our problems. So while our outlook may seem new, and while our methods may break with tradition, 
They are highly practical in a country of scattered population and fantastic area. We've had to unify our services because so many of the people who need the most help live in the most remote places. In the deep Rockies and the coast range, in the Kootenays and up in the Caribou country, our workers have to drive many lonely miles to make their calls. The rural social worker out here is like a country doctor who has to handle all kinds of cases and get there somehow. Inland transportation is only half the problem. We have 3,000 miles of the most rugged coastline in the world. So it's a matter of routine for some of our people to do most of their traveling by boat. Our own launch, the Sheely, is the workhorse of the service. It makes short runs to the Gulf Islands, longer voyages carrying social workers to the villages on the north coast of Vancouver Island, and other distant places that can be reached only by sea. The social worker is a familiar figure on the coastal steamers that bring freight and mail to the ports in the mainland. Sometimes he's lucky enough to travel on one of the big passenger boats, but he's more likely to thumb his way up and down coast by forestry or police patrol vessel, or by one of the fishing craft if he's going to keep on schedule. One of our workers listed 38 different methods of British Columbia transportation by sea and by land, ranging all the way from water taxi to an ascent of a mountain by cable car to reach a mining camp high above it. try to achieve a broad point of view on rural welfare. We feel that all the people in this province are entitled to the best social services we can provide, no matter where they live. And it's up to us to reach them, regardless of race or creed, because we have people of all colors and religions. Of Indians alone, we have 30,000. Their affairs are handled by the Indian agents, but our workers visit the reservations on cases involving family members living outside. It isn't always easy to get accurate information from some ancient woman who reckons years in terms of natural events such as floods, blips of long ago. And then, we've always had a large Asiatic population. Japanese, Hindus, Chinese. The Chinese quarter of Nanaimo dates back to pioneer days. We visit their old age pensioners, but there isn't much need of social assistance because Chinese fraternal societies do a good job of looking after their own people. But the Duca boys do present a problem. They remain aloof. One of their communal villages on Vancouver Island is completely fenced in for protection against rival Duca boy groups. For a long time they resisted any recognition of government authority as part of their religion. But one of our workers is now permitted to enter the strange colony at Hilliard's. It's a controversial question, but he has won their confidence to a point where this group now recognizes old age pensions and birth registrations. Because there are no marriage ceremonies among these people, and a woman may have a child only by permission of the elders who select the father, a child born in this colony has a number instead of a name and belongs to the whole community, not to its parents. So our worker must register the first baby in the village of Archangel as Gabriel Archangelovich I, a child of unmarried parents, father's identity unknown. Freddie Wilson's hometown is a long way from Vancouver, but a traveling child guidance clinic comes to our community hall several times a year. My name is Dorothy Jenner. I'm the social worker here, and I ask the Wilsons to bring Freddie to the clinic. When a boy gets into trouble, there's often a health problem behind it, sometimes physical, more often mental. And if it isn't corrected, he may get into trouble again. 
That's why we had Freddy come to the clinic, and why we asked his parents to come, too. Because the public health nurse told me she thought some of the trouble lay with George Wilson, the father. It was a health matter, largely physical and partly mental. But Freddy's personal problem was only one element. Although Freddy's school marks had fallen off, the clinical test showed that he was actually above average in perception and coordination. Really a bright boy. But there are things that even a bright boy can't understand without help. A talk with George Wilson brought out the truth. He was a sick man, but he couldn't face up to the idea of going to a sanatorium because he thought he couldn't afford to quit work. He tried doctoring himself, took out his fear and anxiety on his family. The home became so unhappy and insecure that the bewildered Freddy ran away from it. So we sit down to discuss a plan of action. There is a good deal of social assistance in our province for cases like this, if the Wilsons had only known. Now we can do something. And in the light of what we know now, I'm very glad the magistrate didn't send Freddy to industrial school. Although for Joe Zangara, it's a better place than his own home. Some people think of the industrial school as a prison. But Dick Maxwell, our social worker there, says he likes to regard it as a sort of hospital. Maxwell works along with the boys so he can help head them the right way when they leave school. He is an important link between the lads and the outside world. Watching Joe, he learned something. Although Joe came from the city, he was crazy about the country and fond of animals, especially horses. Maxwell thought there might be an answer in that. Quite a job persuading old Tom McKeever to come to town and get fixed up with a new set of teeth. It's ten years since he's been in Kamloops, and now that he's here, I'm going to take him for a little drive. I've been telling Tom about the provincial men's home, so perhaps we'll drop in there and look around. Ever decides to move in here. It seems a sensible thing to do, but he'll have to make up his own mind. In our work, we find it isn't a good idea to talk people into anything. We encourage them to make their own decisions. Well, Peggy, it's a very big decision. She loves her baby so much and does want to keep him. But how can she? Her sister can't help. She has a family of her own. Everybody has been advising Peggy to be sensible, to give up the baby for adoption. So I've brought the necessary papers for her to sign. so young to shoulder so much responsibility, but no one else can make the decision for her. She has to make up her own mind. George Wilson was at a crossroads in his life too, but there was only one possible decision. It's a long way from the Wilson home to Tronquil Sanatorium, but we have a social worker on the sanatorium staff. She is a link between patients and their homes, through social workers in all parts of the province. I wrote to her the other day to tell her that George doesn't need to worry because everything is going well on the Wilson home front. We're supposed to be very objective and all that, but I really enjoy visiting Mrs. Wilson and Freddie. Every time I call, I'm impressed by the way Freddie is responding to the fact that he's now the man of the house. He feels useful and needed. 
He's a normal kid now. The other youngsters used to find him hard to get along with. But now he's counted as one of the gang. I don't think we'll have any more trouble with Freddie. As for Mrs. Wilson, she's getting living assistance on the same standard they had before. And she's happy because I'm able to tell her that George is getting better and it won't be long before he's home again. If I'm ever transferred away from the Cantaloupe's office, I hope they'll send me up to the Caribou country, last of the Old West. Al Scott, the social worker up there, used to be a bomber pilot. After the war, he wanted a job with a touch of adventure and a chance to do a little good in the world. Well, this is it. up there said he could give a good home to a boy who needed help. So Al wrote to our man Maxwell at the industrial school and Maxwell sent up a boy named Joe. This Joe was a youngster who had been running away from things all his life. Some of us didn't think it would work out, but Maxwell had him sized up right. Joe's finding it a little strange yet, but he's working hard, he's happy here, and the folks on the ranch like him. I think he's found himself. My territory goes partway into the Caribou. There's a good highway now following the route of the old Caribou Trail. Pioneer towns are going modern. There's a case I've got to check here. Widow woman. We helped her a bit after her husband died. Now she has a small store and tourist camp. She's a kind woman. Said she wanted to pay us back by helping someone else if she could. So Miss Warren suggested a girl to keep her company and help out in the store. So that's how Peggy came here. The villagers don't know Peggy's story. And what they don't know won't hurt them. Somehow they've got the idea she's been deserted by her husband. I think the old lady who runs the store sold him on that. Anyhow, she's more concerned with Peggy's future than Peggy's past, and with the future of that baby. I'm glad Peggy didn't sign the adoption papers. She really loves her baby, and that's good for both of them. I wish all our cases turned out as well, but they don't. It's a big country, and we're working with all kinds of people. But when I leave Peggy and hurry on to my next call, it makes me feel good that some people are better and happier for what we do. It makes me feel that all our trouble and travel in this tremendous country is worthwhile. It's good to know that people in trouble think of the social worker as a friend at the door. We make mistakes like everyone else, but we're helping some people over difficulties so they can stand on their own feet instead of being a drag on others. could make half a dozen calls in the time it takes to cross that canyon and visit old Tom McKeever. Yes, that unsanitary old reprobate is back. I thought he would like the men's home, but not him. Too many people around, he said, not enough trains. He's a darned old nuisance. And yet, I'll miss him when he's gone. <laughs> 